Thank you, Madam Speaker. The gentleman from Maryland talked about protecting this institution or talked about this institution, but we got a $40 billion bill at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't had a chance to review the bill. My staff is pouring over the pages trying to see what's in it. You want to talk about the institution? You want to talk about standing up alongside Ukraine? Why don't we actually have a debate on the floor of the People's House instead of the garbage of getting a $40 billion bill at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Not paid for, without having any idea what's really in it, with a massive slush fund that goes to the State Department, $13 billion, $8 billion for the Economic Support Fund, $110 million for Embassy Security. We've got $40 billion that is unpaid for, and you want to sit here and lecture this body about what we're going to do or not do about standing alongside Ukraine? Why don't we talk about the American people who are hurting, the wide open borders, the inflation that's killing people, the jobs that people can't get because of the cost of goods and services in this country? Sitting here and being lectured to when I don't even have time to look at a $40 billion unpaid bill. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I rise in opposition to the Ukrainian supplemental bill. $40 billion. But there's no baby formula for American mothers and babies. An unknown amount of money to the CIA in the Ukraine supplemental bill, but there's no formula for American babies and mothers. $54 million in COVID spending in Ukraine, but there's no formula for American babies and mothers. $900 million for nonprofits and organizations in Ukraine, but there's no formula for American babies and mothers. The brutality of Putin is not just what he's doing in Ukraine, but the impact that, his, that it is having on food for the world. So when you're home thinking, what is this all about? Just think about when I was hungry, you fed me in the Gospel of Matthew. Good morning from a very hot and sunny Nicosia, Cyprus. Let's get to some news because we've got a lot to talk about. You saw the opening intro with, uh, with Congress debating the $40 billion spending package that's going to be fast-tracked to Ukraine. You had 57 Republicans oppose it. The rest of Congress, all the Democrats and the remaining Republicans approved it. $40 billion is going to go to Ukraine. All it needs now is for Mitch McConnell to, uh, to get the Senate to approve it, and it's on its way. Another $40 billion more. That's on top of the, the other $17, $18 billion that has already been given to Ukraine from the U.S. That goes on top of the billions that uh, the EU has given to Ukraine. It's so bad for the, uh, for the EU that they are actually going to go into debt. They're going to actually borrow money to, uh, to fund Ukraine to the tune of $15 billion every three months. But uh, $40 billion, fast track to Ukraine. You saw Chip Roy from Texas, Marjorie Taylor Greene. They were pretty much outraged. Marjorie Taylor Greene, rightly so, is pointing to the fact that there is no baby formula in the United States, but there's $40 billion to, to give to Alensky. Chip Roy was, uh, was very upset with the fact that this bill was given to him at like three in the afternoon to be approved like in an hour or two. So, I mean, he's like, this is ridiculous. And, uh, and they're right. They're absolutely right. Because the $40 billion could be spent on securing the U.S. southern border. It could be spent on health care in the United States. It could be spent on student loans and education. It could be spent on the homeless, on infrastructure. I've actually uh, heard that the $40 billion could fix pretty much every road and bridge in the United States, which is pretty, pretty amazing to hear that. That $40 billion could actually fix most of the U.S.'s infrastructure problems. And, uh, you know, that money is going to be set now, supposedly, my God, oh, supposedly it's going to be sent, sidewalks in Cyprus, to, uh, to help fight the Russians, to weaken the Russians, because that is the goal, right? A prolonged insurgency 
and to weaken Russia. And uh, that money is going to be used to, uh, to achieve those goals. When you look at the, the actual spending of that money in the bill, you see that a lot of it is just going to R&D, to the military industrial complex for weapons and R&D. That's how they make their money. So they've gotten rid of all their stockpiles, the MIC, the weapons manufacturers, and now they're, uh, they're going to cash in some more with uh, some big R&D and uh, manufacturing contracts. There's also money going to like the CIA in the bill, and there's money going to, uh, to like research facilities, like scientific research facilities in Ukraine, whatever the hell that means. Anyway, all kinds of nonsense. Basically, you're looking at a major, uh, major wash job, if you know what I mean. They're gonna wash the money. <laughs> Send it to Ukraine and wash it up real nice, get it nice and laundered. And then uh, give it back out to, uh, to everybody. Divvy it up to everybody that's involved in this racket. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, you know that this is a racket when Nancy Pelosi's quoting the Bible. And she's quoting like Matthew. Feed, feed and clothe the hungry, Pelosi is, uh, is telling the American people. You got to get those, uh, those high heels to clown President Zelensky, don't you? <laughs> She's talking about feeding the hungry while the United States is, is actually, actually has babies who are going hungry. The very, very poor uh, choice of uh, scripture from, uh, from Pelosi, very poor. Or maybe it's deliberate. Maybe she's, you know, just poking fun at, uh, at the American people saying, while your babies go hungry, we're all going to cash in on a big $40 billion payday. So, uh, yeah, everyone's asking why, why is this happening? You know, all the, uh, all the pundits and analysts are saying, why is uh, the U.S. sending 40 billion to Ukraine? Why are they doing this? Where's the money going to go? Why is it happening? Well, it's happening because it's easy money. This is so much better than the coup for, uh, for them. So much better than the coup. The coup you had to deal with like big pharma and doctors and all kinds of stuff for, for that uh, money, to get your hands on that money. This is a lot cleaner for them. Just uh, put it in some sort of spending package, send it to Ukraine. And uh, once it gets to Ukraine, the most corrupt country in Europe, it'll be pretty easy to get that money back out. So that's why they're doing this. There's no money in solving baby formula shortages. There's no money in that. So why should they solve that? <laughs> That's why this is happening. Now there's money in Ukraine. We've seen that from Biden going back to 2014. There's big money in Ukraine. Hunter Biden, Pelosi's kids, Mitt Romney's kids, uh, John Kerry, Christopher Hines. I mean, there's money to be made in Ukraine. If, uh, if you rub shoulders with the right oligarchs and the right clown puppet presidents. So yeah, that's why this is being fast-tracked. That's why Mitch McConnell says there's no, there's no more important issue right now in the world than Ukraine. Yeah, if you're getting a cut of that 40 billion, it's damn important. You better get that bill through. So uh, that's what's going on there. You know, I, I said last week it's gonna be 40 billion, not 33. Sure enough, it's 40 billion. And uh, you have the Lend Lease now is gonna get uh, started. So they're going to put Ukraine into a hell of a lot of debt. And that's actually not going to be Ukraine's debt. That's going to be the EU's debt because the EU said they're going to pay off all of uh, Ukraine's bills. So the Lend-Lease will be giving weapons to Ukraine. Ukraine's going to have to pay back those weapons. And uh, the EU is taking care of all of Ukraine's debt. So in essence, the EU is going to be paying back those weapons. So that's how all of this goes, is one big grift. But, you know, it's happening because we're, we're entering an endgame. We are, uh, this started in 2014 with the Obama EU coup d'etat of Viktor Yanukovych during the Maidan in Ukraine, and we're, ending to, uh, and, and we're heading towards the end. And, uh, you know, what's the end going to look like? Probably it's going to be a, a strip of land in the middle of Ukraine that's landlocked. That's what's going to be called Ukraine, a strip of land, you know, say Kiev to the north, 
you know, going down towards the center of, uh, of what is now Ukraine. Russia will have uh, essentially what, what is known as Novorossiya, stretching from Kharkiv all the way down to, uh, to Odessa, connecting to Transnistria, and uh, Poland. Poland's going to probably move into the West. That's the way it looks. So Ukraine will be a country that's, that's got Russia to the East and Poland to the West because the, uh, the Polish Prime Minister, Morawiecki, he, uh, he penned an interesting uh, op-ed in uh, the UK's Telegraph. So he chose uh, the Telegraph in the UK to pretty much announce that, uh, that Poland is uh, gearing up to, to move into the West with a peacekeeping mission or some, some nonsense like that, some sort of peacekeeping uh, force. 9,000 soldiers is what uh, I'm hearing. There are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of documents and, and tweets, specifically one document that's going around Telegraph and uh, going around Telegram, going around Telegram and Twitter, which is saying that uh, that Poland is indeed preparing 9,000 uh, soldiers to to enter the west of Ukraine. I don't know if it's true or not, but the document looks legit. It all looks legit. So who knows? And supposedly this intervention is going to happen like around the 22nd, 24th of May. We'll see. We will see. You know what happened? I was walking under the tree and I walked like right into a spider's web. <laughs> I hate when that happens. So I've got like a web around me. Anyway, let's just power through the video. <laughs> so uh, so Morawiecki pens this, this op-ed in the Telegraph. And uh, he pretty much says that this is a, a world war. This is a war between uh, the West and the East. Putin is saying that, this is what Mordovetsky says, Putin is positioning this as denazification, and Mordovetsky of Poland, he is saying that uh, we should go to war with Russia in order to, uh, to fight the Ruski Mir ideology. And that's what he calls it, the Ruski Mir ideology. He says it's... Uh, it's a dangerous, corrupt, and evil ideology. He compares the Ruski Mir ideology to uh, Stalin or uh, NAZI Germany. And uh, he's making the case that it's time for Poland to, uh, to get involved. That's his, uh, that's his op-ed. And behind Morawiecki is uh, the real leader of Poland, who's Kaczynski. He's the real, uh, the real prime minister slash president. Morawiecki is just uh, a front. And uh, Kaczynski's, he's a head case. <laughs> he's a head case. He hates Russia. Boy, does he hate Russia. And his hate is going to cost Poland dearly. But, you know, when you're blinded and driven by hate, then, you know, sometimes you're going to have to uh, pay a heavy price for your hate. But, uh, yeah, Morawiecki actually says that... Uh, what Europe needs to do, what the collective West needs to do, is they need to undertake a de-Putinfication. That's what he actually calls it, a de-Putinfication of the world. So, you know, he's basically saying, I mean, he's one step away from declaring war on Russia. Really, that op-ed is one step away from declaring war against Russia. And the entire Ruski Mir, that means Belarus, that means Russia. That could mean much of Eurasia as well. You know, the Ruski Mir is pretty, it's pretty big. You're talking about all the former uh, Soviet Union countries and satellites. So Morawiecki is laying the, uh, the groundwork. He's putting it, all, uh, putting it all down to prepare the, uh, the Polish people and the collective West, because it's in the Telegraph that he wrote this for uh, Poland intervention. Let's hope it doesn't happen. But that's how it looks. And so if Poland enters the, the west of Ukraine, a couple of things could happen. The first thing that could happen is that uh, these 9,000 troops are allowed by Russia to enter up to a certain point to take Lviv and to take a little, little bit of the area around Lviv. As Putin noted during his, uh, his speech before the special military operation, that those areas are are historically Polish areas, so maybe the Russians tell Poland, go ahead and uh, 
and take it, but up to a certain point, no more, no less. And Poland agrees to that. And there you have the effective uh, disintegration of the state of Ukraine as we know it, because Poland takes the West, Russia takes, uh, takes much of the East and the South, and Russia is, is winning the war now decisively. Expect a collapse of the Ukraine military very, very soon, much like what happened in Syria, where it was a slow grind, a war of attrition, and the Russians were just pounding away, and the Syrians were pounding away at uh, Obama, the Obama-backed moderate rebels. Eventually, real quick, like in the span of a day, Obama's moderate rebels, they just collapsed. Expect something along those lines because I'm getting a lot of reports, credible reports that Ukraine commanders are surrendering. The military is, uh, is just being ground down and it's a pretty horrific situation what's happening in, uh, in the east of uh, Ukraine, the Donbass. So I expect uh, this war of attrition to continue. Russia is the absolute best when it comes to, to these types of war of attrition but eventually you're going to get a very quick collapse and it's going to happen like overnight. And everyone's going to be sitting there saying, oh my God, I thought, I thought that Ukraine was winning. Ghost of Kiev, Snake Island. You know, they're marching from Kharkov to, into Russia. I thought they were winning. And it's going to be a really, really big shock. And that could happen in the next couple of weeks. It may take longer, but it's happening. So, um, you know, Russia may say, okay, uh, Poland, you can go up to this line, and that's it. And then Poland gets stuck with uh, a Nazi-infested Bandera ideology that they have to take care of. I mean, forever. Take care of it forever. And it's not going to be a good thing for, for Poland. I mean, it's going to be a, a noose around Poland's neck, and it's going to be a noose around the EU's neck. Um, these are not the type of... Uh, these Bandera guys, and they've got a lot of weapons as well, because... Alensky pumped them up with weapons. Let's cross. I shouldn't be crossing here, but, you know, let's cross. There's no one around. So, <laughs> yeah, because Alensky pumped them up with weapons, and, you know, they're going to be uh, Poland's problem going forward. So that may be one scenario. The other scenario, which is the, the very dangerous scenario, is that uh, Putin makes good on his promise, which is, do not enter the conflict or else you're going to face uh, terrible consequences with, uh, with lightning speed. You're not going to know what hits you. And obviously Putin's talking about hypersonic missiles and uh, hypersonic missiles that the 9,000 Polish soldiers are not going to see coming and it's just going to flatten them. And, uh, you know, the collective West has been terribly misled. They've been... Uh, They've been manipulated and conned to believe that Russia is going slow in the East because Russia doesn't have a good military or a good strategy, and that's a lie. Russia is going slow in the East because Russia is fighting a war of attrition where they want to make sure that the lives of Russian soldiers are, uh, are safeguarded. They don't want unnecessary death of Russian soldiers. They don't want the unnecessary death of, uh, of civilians in the Donbass. And uh, they want to preserve the, the infrastructure as best as, as they can because the Russians care about Donbass. They care about the south of Ukraine. They care about Kherson and what will be Nikolaev and Odessa when the Russians do decide to, to take those back. They care about these places. And uh, they don't care about Lviv or the Polish military. So they're not going to be so, uh, so soft if they do decide to take action against uh, a possible Polish incursion into the, uh, the west of Ukraine. And so we'll see what will happen. We will see what will happen because if the Russians do take action, if that scenario plays out and the Russians take action, it's a nice little church. Then, uh, then you have the question, does, uh, does NATO respond? Because this is being positioned in the documents that I've seen. This is being positioned as um, a Polish intervention, not a NATO-sanctioned intervention. So you see the U.S. 
and the U.S. is puppeteering Kaczynski and the, the Polish prime minister. The U.S. is puppeteering them because the U.S. is saying, you know what, let Poland go. Let's see what happens and we'll play it from there. Let's see how Russia responds. And given uh, Russia's response, then we'll, we'll see how we want to play it. So the U.S. may very well say this is an attack on NATO. The U.S. may also say, Poland, you're on your own. This is not our problem. So we don't know what's going to happen there. Um, the U.S. is definitely playing it smart because they've got a, a hysterical Poland, a hysterical Polish government that wants to go in. And so the U.S. is saying, yeah, be my guest, but this is not a NATO operation, but let's see how it goes. And maybe we'll brand it a NATO operation or maybe Poland, if you guys get uh, decimated, we'll let it go. The other option is that uh, this may be an off ramp. This may be an off ramp for everybody. What do I mean? I mean that, uh, that Poland goes in, they get the West. Biden and co get a nice PR victory saying, you see, uh, NATO forces led by the Poles, along with U.S. military support. We went in, we took the west of Ukraine. We liberated the, uh, the west of Ukraine. We, uh, we prevented Russia from marching further west. We've created a safe buffer zone for Europe. And uh, democracy wins out over Putin's uh, invading force. Now, the rest of Ukraine that gets carved up and decimated, they're not going to talk about it. This will just kind of be their PR spin. Something along those lines. I can definitely see the script writers in D.C. framing it in that type of way, you know. Uh, we went in, we got our, our, our territory, and now uh, Putin's been stopped because of NATO's intervention. You see, all is good. Uh, it provides an off-ramp for Russia as well, because Russia can say, okay, you guys got your piece, we're going to get ours, and we end it there frozen conflict. Poland gets the West. We get the East and the South. We create a little rump, uh, Ukraine in the middle, which, uh, which will be taken care of by, uh, by Ursula van der Crazy and the EU. So they're going to have to deal with that. And, and we leave it there, right? That could be uh, an off-ramp to all of this madness. And then the U.S. can move on to, uh, to China, <laughs> you know, something along those lines. That's a possibility as well. Anyway, we will see what happens. We're going to see what happens. Um, end of May, I guess we'll, uh, we'll get a little better, we'll get a little, little clearer picture as to what exactly Poland is planning to do. If anything, Poland may not do anything, which is also a possibility. That's, uh, that's probably the most possible thing that will happen is that Poland doesn't do anything. And this letter written by, uh, by the Polish prime minister is, is just another hysterical rant in uh, in a UK publication. So anyway, let's leave that there. And uh, since we're talking about NATO, Finland came out with an announcement saying that they are going to, uh, to enter NATO. So that means that Sweden will also enter NATO. So that's kind of a done deal. Uh, as I've been saying for a while, uh, Finland and Sweden are gonna get into NATO. I've been actually saying this for, for about two months now. Um, it's done, it's done, they're gonna enter NATO. The, uh, the Russian military of defense, by the way, also came out with another uh, drip feed document with regard to biolabs. And uh, check it out on Telegram. Check it out on, uh, on Russian media if you want to translate, because the Russian media is running with this as well. If you have access to RT, they ran a couple of articles on this. So basically, the Russian military ministry of defense is basically saying that, uh, that these biolabs is interesting, actually. What they were doing with these biolabs and once again, this is Russian side of things. So this may be propaganda, but what the Russian Ministry of Defense was saying is that these documents show that these uh, bio labs were conducting research, R&D in Ukraine, and they were able to conduct this research at, at a very low cost because obviously doing research in Ukraine means that you don't have all of the, uh, the regulatory costs and, and all the, uh, the safety issues and the safety costs with running these labs that you would have in, in the West. And so, you know, they, they ended up saving a lot of money doing their uh, bio and chemical R&D in Ukraine. And what uh, the companies did, what the research facilities and the pharma companies would do is they would take that cost and they would uh, pass a chunk of it off to the Democrat 
uh, campaign to the Democrat Party, the DNC, and the DNC would use that money to fund their political campaigns. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just an incredible claim. Take it for what t- take it for what it is. If you believe it or not, I don't know, but it does kind of make sense. You have to admit, you know, you get very cheap uh, R and D costs in Ukraine because you don't have all of the uh, all of the the overhead associated with doing these types of businesses in the say in the U.S. or in Europe. And uh, you take that cost and you split it up with uh, with the party that allows you to to do your R&D in Ukraine, i.e. the Democrat Party. And I'm sure the Republicans knew about this as well. I don't think this was hidden to the Republicans either. But uh, you take that money and you run your political campaigns for for Hillary and for uh, Potato Head Biden. But uh, the, the Russians also said that Germany and Poland were in on this. So they said that Germany, that the Germans and the Poles were, uh, were well aware and they were active participants in these bio, uh, bio lab research centers. And they also made a very interesting claim. And I, I don't know if I believe this, but they did say that these research facilities were like putting uh, like tuberculosis on banknotes and then sending those banknotes, counterfeit banknotes to, uh, to Donbass to see if... Uh, if children would get infected with, with this, I don't know. This, I don't know, but this is just what the Russian Ministry of Defense said. Once again, read the documents. There's a lot of information out there. Make up your own mind. The one thing that I will say is that when I was in Athens, I did say that this bio lab, lab stuff would be just uh, a drip feed of information. Every two, three weeks, the Russians would come out with more and more documents and more info on these bio labs and this is going to last for like two years and i think i'm spot on there i think the russians have a cache of of documents just like a mile long a cache of information just stacked up where they're just going to drip feed this every two three weeks they're just going to put out more documents as to what was going on with regards to these 20 26 28 bio labs in ukraine so we have that story and uh what else should i talk about Let's see. Boris, by the way, was in Finland, and he said he's going to provide the NATO, the soon-to-be NATO country, with security guarantees, courtesy of the English people, courtesy of the UK. I don't know what what security guarantees the UK is going to provide to Finland, but you know, Boris was there, and he's making sure that Finland's going to be taken care of, courtesy of the of the UK. And uh, all the while, we're getting reports in the UK that. Uh, that people are getting a lot poorer. I think like the CEO of Tesco was, uh, or, or, or someone, someone in the UK, someone associated with Tesco, maybe like a research group. Anyway, they were, um, they were monitoring shoppers' habits in the UK, and they were saying that for the first time, they've seen uh, UK shoppers actually go to the cash register, go to the till, and tell the, uh, the cashier, look, I've got 40 pounds, that's it. So ring up whatever you're going to ring up. And once you get over 40 pounds, just let me know. And I'm just going to, you know, take back all the other items that I have in my basket. So, I mean, things are really, really bad in, uh, in the UK. But poor Boris, he couldn't, couldn't really care. He's off to Finland making sure that, uh, <laughs> that the UK military is going to, going to do something. I don't know what they're going to do if... Uh, with, with Finland, but hey, whatever. <laughs> clown, clown world. Clown world. And that's not going to be the clown world segment, though. Um, the clown world segment actually is going to deal with Elon Musk. And Musk sent a tweet where he claims that his Starlink satellite thingy is, uh, is, is causing all kinds of problems for the Russians. And he says that, uh, he said this, that Starlink has resisted Russian cyber war jamming and hacking attempts so far, but they're ramping up their efforts. So, you know, this is uh, Elon Musk being a clown. You have to be honest, even uh, a man worth 200 billion can be a clown. And he's being a clown by poking the bear and trying to play this, uh, this Tony Stark figure that a lot of people think he is, even though Tony Stark and Iron Man, they're not real. This is a Marvel comic book fiction. But I think Elon Musk, being the master marketer that he is, he's trying to play up to that Tony Stark image. 
and now he's saying that Starlink is, is giving the Russians all kinds of problems. Maybe it is. Um, they say that Starlink is what the Azov NAZIs are using in the, in the catacombs of, uh, of the steel factory to, to broadcast their show. Because right now it seems like they have a show. I mean, they're broadcasting all the time now. But um, supposedly they're using Starlink. Musk says that he delivered like something like 5,000 Starlink like units, what you use to connect to Starlink to Ukraine. And he's kind of taking credit for, uh, for being a thorn in the side of, uh, of the Russians. But um, if the Russians really wanted to cut off the communication in Ukraine, they would have done it. And that includes Starlink. And they would have blasted Starlink satellites out of the air or done something to, uh, to take out Starlink. That I'm convinced of. I think that Elon Musk is being uh, a little bit of a showboat and he's trying to poke the bear. And that's kind of a stupid thing to do because if the Russians start to take notice and start to, to give a damn about Starlink's uh, internet access, internet, internet service in Ukraine, then they just might uh, send a couple, a couple of hypersonic missiles Starlink's way in, uh, in space. I don't know. They may do something like that. But anyway, I think that, uh, that Musk... Is, is trying to play the, the Tony Stark role, but he's kind of looking like a clown because at the end of the day, your Starlink uh, internet service is being used by NAZIs to, to broadcast their message. So it's not really a good look, Elon, not a good look at all. But um, have you guys seen the Azov guys since we're talking about Clown World and the shows that they're putting out, the broadcasts that they're putting out? So the Azov guys did... Uh, did a segment on Sky News yesterday, and my clown world yesterday actually was the Sky News show with uh, with the Russian UN representative, the deputy UN representative, where he kind of pointed out uh, Alensky's Instagram post or or, tele, or Telegram post where Alensky showed an Azov military guy. And uh, anyway, go to go to my video that I did yesterday, and you'll see what I'm talking about with that Sky News segment. And Sky News yesterday ran a segment with uh, the Azov guy. And I say the Azov guy because you have this Azov like commander or, or whatever he is. Um, and he's kind of become the face of the resistance in the Azov steel uh, factory. And he's got the eye patch, hair slicked back. His English is, is perfect. I mean, his English is super fluent. The guy's... Uh, the guy's spot on when it comes to the English language, better than my English. And he's sitting there giving an interview, like a seven minute interview with Sky News. And he's talking about the resistance and how they're fighting the Russians. And it's, you know, really an, an intense battle, but they're staying strong and they're beating back the Russian, uh, the Russian movements towards the steel factory. And just all of this, this Hollywood scripted nonsense. And uh, I just can't help but think this is, this is this is complete BS. My, my, my BS alarm went off because um, the whole thing just seems Hollywood. It seems like we're being prepared for a Netflix Hollywood uh, blockbuster movie where it's going to be something along the lines of, uh, of 300 with the Spartans or Dunkirk or something like that where you have these courageous and brave Azov and AZIs fighting back the, uh, the evil Russians and preventing the, the fall of Mariupol, which will eventually fall. Never mind the fact that Mariupol is already in Russian control and they had a victory day parade as well and <laughs> all of that stuff. Just forget about that stuff that the mainstream media is not reporting, the Western mainstream media. And just keep focused on the fact that you have this group of NAZIs along with 50, uh, 50 French NATO soldiers and maybe a U.S. general and a Canadian general who's now in, uh, in Moscow spilling the beans on what's going on. But never mind all of that. Here's the, the eye patch dude who, who's, uh, who's talking about the brave resistance in perfect English. And the photos that they put out from Azov style, like the Instagram posts, I mean, they got like a whole social media campaign going on. I can never take photos like this, the lighting, the poses, I mean, some people, some of the soldiers are without limbs there and it looks terrible um, what they've suffered, but the photos are uh, absolutely compelling. 
I mean, professional stuff, professional photography, really, really uh, incredible uh, f photographs that they're putting out on Instagram from uh, the Azov Steel Factory. Even the guy's interview was uh, the lighting, the mic, all of it seemed very professional. So I understand that they're saying he may be using the Starlink internet service um, in the Azov catacombs, though I wonder how far down in the catacombs the guys are if they're able to, uh, to connect with Starlink. I don't know. I don't know how it works. But um, what, what kind of cameras do they have there? Their lighting, their, uh, their mics, all of it. It seems like it's a real professional freaking operation they have going there. Like, I mean, a social media, a professional social media video photojournalist operation that's going on there. Those are just my thoughts, my impressions. Maybe these guys are not only, you know, NAZI fighters. Maybe, maybe they are. Maybe they were uh, cameramen and technicians and stuff like that uh, before they got stuck in Azov and before they got uh, drafted into the Alensky army. So maybe these guys know what they're doing. Who knows? Maybe they were social media marketing professionals before they, uh, they entered the, the fight. I don't know. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think down below. The whole thing just seems very, very bizarre. It really does. Um, but mark my words, in six months to a year's time, you will have uh, a big Netflix Hollywood movie all about the brave resistance of the, uh, the Azov-style steel factory fighters. And that's going to be the name of the movie, Azov-style. Mark my words. Mark my words. That's what you're going to have in, uh, in one year's time. Anyway, uh, theduran.locals.com. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.